Welcome everybody um, to the first uh, breakout session of the day and of the summit. Um, I'm, I'm Jory Wantraub. I am with Eris and I'm going to be uh, the session host for this meeting, which means I'm going to shortly be muting myself and staying sort of invisible in the background and, and letting um, the presenters do their thing. The session is titled Cohort, Creating Opportunities to Harmonize Outputs Across Research and Practice, because who doesn't love a great acronym? I like that one. Um, and we have four presenters today, co-presenters. Uh, in the order they are listed on my screen, Jeff Hunt from the American Society of Microbiology, Reese Cloyd from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Sarah Garlick from the Hubbard Brook Foundation, and Sarah Yeo, am I pronouncing it right, Sarah Yeo, from University of Utah. And we are recording this session. We do have um, the closed captioning going, so you should be able to see that if you choose to use that. And with that, um, I will hand it over to our speakers. You are welcome to put questions in chat throughout, and I believe there will be, where they've structured the session, there will be plenty of time towards the end for Q&A and discussion. But with that, I hand it off to our presenters. Please take it away. Cool, thank you, Jory. Um, welcome everybody, thanks for joining our session. Uh, as Jory said, my name is Jeff Hunt, and I handle public engagement uh, for the American Society for Microbiology. Um, so I'm just going to give sort of an introduction about what the session is and what we're hoping to achieve. And then my co-presenters are going to give a couple of examples um, to sort of stir the discussion. Um, so I, I just want to share a link in the chat uh, for, of a paper that I read last week from Dietram Schoifele, who's a researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it was sort of a retrospective for the journal Public Understanding of Science. And in it, he sort of goes through sort of not quite the history, but sort of looks back over the past couple of decades about what's gone on in the fields of research and practice as they relate to public engagement with science. And he highlights a lot of the issues that we've been thinking a lot about as, a, as this small group sort of this interface between research and practice. Um, we all come at this issue from different perspectives, but I think one thing that we all sort of agree upon is that there is this interface and this boundary between research and practice and that it doesn't get spanned or crossed very well. And there's a lot of difficulty of translating research into practice. And there's a lot of difficulty of practice applying the research that's done and the research being appropriate and applicable to the practice that is done in this space. And so that's really sort of the, the mindset that we're coming from with this session and that we've been thinking about as a group. So I want to give a little bit just about sort of why us and why is this an issue that the four of us are talking about, um, essentially our origin story. Uh, we actually were a cohort. It's not just the fancy acronym. Um, we were uh, all members of a research practice task force that was organized by the Center for Advancing Informal STEM Education, or CASE. Um, they have a biennial meeting for PIs uh, from the ASL program that NSF supports. And they asked this task force to basically come together to develop an activity that could take place at the 2019 meeting. Um, so we came together, we brainstormed. It wasn't just the four of us, there were about 10 folks on that, on that group. And we came up with some activities that took place at that meeting in 2019. Um, we also came up with a toolkit that currently lives on the CASE website, which I'll drop in the chat here, um, basically helping to sort of walk people through these issues as they sort of planned out their NSF grants you know, how can I apply research to my practice? If I'm a researcher, how can I connect with practitioners? Um, and so because it was such a great collection of people with so much energy and sort of intellectual curiosity, we thought, well, what else can we do? What's sort of the next step? Where can we go from here? And sort of that's how we came up with this acronym and this idea of how can we address this research practice divide? And like most great ideas, um, it sort of died in the room after we went through a day long discussion about the idea. I think our major accomplishment was coming up with that acronym um, and that was it. So 
what we are hoping to do is figure out a way of how can not just us, but the people who are here today in this virtual space and the community as a whole, really start to take concrete steps to address this issue and how this issue resonates with you in either your, your work, either as a researcher or as a practitioner um, or whatever space you sort of define yourself in. Um, so there obviously has been work that's been done in this space by other organizations. So we're not claiming that this is a novel idea or something unique, um, but we just wanna see what can actually happen. Um, so that's sort of my introduction. What we're hoping for is a lot of discussion and interaction. So this is not going to be a session you're going to sit and hear from us. You're going to hear from us a little bit, and then we're going to ask you to actually really contribute. Um, so my co-presenters are each going to share some examples from their world. But really, we are going to want to hear from you about sort of challenges you've faced, ideas that you have come up with, and maybe some potential solutions. Um, so that's it for me. And I think I'm kicking it over to Sarah Yo to start things off. We're going to share. I think three different approaches to bridging the research practice divide. And so I will start and see if I can share my screen. My name is Sarah Garlick. I'm the Director of Science Policy and Outreach for the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation. We are a nonprofit support arm for a long term ecosystem study in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Um, and I'm going to share. Um, some ideas about research practice partnerships as an approach to addressing the gaps between research and practice in public engagement with science. So research practice partnerships um, or RPPs from the education field, the definition can be defined, can be um, understood as long-term mutually beneficial formalized collaborations between researchers and practitioners. And these are, are oriented around producing relevant research, improving the use of research evidence in decision making and engaging both researchers and practitioners to tackle problems of practice. And in the world I, I live in, I'm facilitating research and practice partnerships for ecologists. And then I'm also part of research practice partnerships in the public engagement space. So it gets kind of meta. Um, there's a deep literature on RPPs, um, particularly from the education field, but also from public health and criminal justice and, and a number of other fields. So I just wanted to fo point folks to a collection of resources by the WT Grant Foundation um, that are a great place to start out. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few insights from a paper that a group of us published in the Journal of Science Communication last year. Um, along with a, a companion two-page practice brief that you can find on informalscience.org. And so for this paper, we enlisted the help of um, Karen Peterman as an external um, researcher to help the members of three different, research, three different public engagement projects to reflect on their work from the lens of research practice partnerships. And so these projects, are the uh, what we call the PES and LTERs project. So that's embedding public engagement with science at long-term ecological research sites. Um, that's a project that I led with John Besley from Michigan State University um, as the researcher, along with Cal Kathy Fallon Lambert and Marissa Weiss as practitioners with me and um, Pamela Templer, Templer and Peter Groffman as ecologists. And we also had the um, Gorilla Science Project that we looked at led by Mark Rosen and Jen Wong as practitioners with Bronwyn Bevan as their um, lead researcher. And the STEM ambassadors program led by Nalini Ned Carney and Caitlin Weber with Sue Allen as their lead researcher. And so these are kind of the three big ideas I wanted to share with you all. So first is this, I'm gonna find my cursor here, um, idea of the the, the boundary spanner as a really key role. And so the boundary spanner just recognizes that researchers and practitioners come from different professional worlds. They, they have different professional currencies, different value systems and different frameworks. And so for RPPs to be successful, those boundaries have to be negotiated. And often in these group projects, it's one or two people in the project who dig in and take the time to adopt what RPP scholars call the dual vantage point. So just being able to see the perspectives of the researcher and the practitioner and apply them to the project at hand. Um, another key thing that we discussed in this paper in, in, our, in our exercise um, was an, the idea of the thinking partner um, role and really being an unexpected benefit to all of our groups. 
So research practice partnerships typically evolve over time. They begin with a period of getting to know each other, and then they transition to, into like the co-design and the co-production of the actual project. But in a lot of cases, they mature, and especially in, in the three projects we looked at, they matured into these less formal relationships that we were talking as about as thinking partner roles, which are, it's really what they sound like. It's having that thinking buddy on speed dial, as Bronwyn Bevan would call it, being able to pick up the phone and, and call your thinking buddy and talk about blending research and practice ideas to emergent um, issues. And then lastly, we just acknowledge that, that these are privileged roles. It takes time to be a boundary spanner. Um, it takes time to, to develop the trust and the understanding that goes, up, goes into robust thinking partnerships. And not everyone has that time. Um, practitioners in particular are often, um, you know, like I have to code all of my time for, by specific projects and I can't always operate in what I thought of as like scholarship mode all the time. And similarly on the research side, early career researchers might have to focus on publishing and they might not be able to devote time to research practice partnerships that, you know, might not produce a ton of traditional data or research insights um, and so just recognizing that folks who can participate in these RPPs might be in these privileged positions. So where we go from here in this conversation, I just want to leave you this one um, idea that is that I've been thinking about, particularly with, with how our work has evolved um, in the, at the LTER network. And so, you know, the boundary spanning work that John Bessley and I did together on, on that one project has led to John, who's a social scientist who studies communication, now being part of um, our long-term ecosystem study. He, he serves as a thinking partner at the organizational level, working with our, our outreach and education staff, as well as our ecologists. He comes to our meetings and he's basically on speed dial for our, our organization. Um, and so I'm, I'm now thinking about this idea of, of scaling RPPs from the perspective of maybe embedding social scientists within STEM research organizations. Um, as a possibility. So I will stop there with those ideas and hand it back over to Sarah if you're with us. I am. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I, my sort of attempt at bridging the gap at research and practice uh, has to do with getting a cohort together, kind of like we got together as a cohort. Um, but the idea really was to try to bring researchers in science communication specifically because that's my field um, together with practitioners in science communication um, and so as I mentioned I'm faculty at the University of Utah I'm, I'm um, in the Department of Communication and I am currently also um, the head of the communicating science health environment and risk division of a particular professional um, organization and as I pull up these slides and that organization is the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication, AEJMC, right? So we are, um, we have an annual conference every year. It's, it's a very research focused conference in, and again, our division is focused on science, environment, health, risk communication research. And so um, as part of this conference, uh, last year, we held a pre-conference that was um, thinking about inclusion and diversity and equity in, in our science communication, environmental communication spaces. And we also partnered with Inclusive SciComm um, to form this cohort. So we have this ISC Inclusive SciComm and ComShare cohort. And the idea we partnered with Sunshine um, at the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and the idea was to kind of get early career practitioners and researchers um, to be part of a cohort that had conversations around research and practice. Um, again, we had nom a nomination process and we targeted early career folks. Um, and they were, they were funded to attend conferences in practice, so the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, where a lot of science communication practitioners um, tend to be, but also um, a research conference, right? And specifically, we uh, 
funded them to attend our annual conference, the AGMC's annual conference. And so throughout the year, uh, they had kind of touch points where they connected with each other. I will say that we did this over 20, in 2021, so it was a pandemic year, right? And so part of this uh, was that it was feasible because we were um, in a pandemic and we were able to do online conferences, right? The, the funding situation is maybe not so feasible when we start to, uh, have more in-person conferences. We also kind of don't know what that's going to look like, right? And so how do we um, get people from different parts of the country and different areas to kind of connect? And we had, um, so we had applicants from uh, the EPA, for example. We had a couple of graduate students. We had some assistant professors, right? And we had some, um, folks who are interested in science communication, but maybe in a different field altogether. So for example, we had a graduate student from a, from a neuroscience program at Emory University join this cohort. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that worked well, I, I am actually waiting to get reports from each of these partnerships. So we partnered up a practitioner and researcher, right, and hoping that they would attend these conferences together and have conversations about it. Um, we started a Slack workspace for everyone to connect. Uh, and, and so there are these sort of touch points. Um, and I'm hoping to hear back from them soon with their reports and kind of thinking about what worked, what didn't, right? And then what kinds of things uh, were helpful to them or um, were there any potential collaborations, for example, that could come out of this, right? So, and this was sort of the original idea that I think Jeff had mentioned when we came together to talk um, as part of CASE, we had some conversations around this. Um, and with that, I will cede my time to Reese. And sorry about the technical difficulties, Zoom. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, another sort of short-term uh, intervention based around conferences. So um, for those of you who have attended the AAAS annual meeting, I hope that you have come to our Communicating Science Seminar, which is one of the kickoff events for the meeting. It's usually um, the Thursday as the meeting is getting started. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to focus in on different aspects of science communication or public engagement and bring together researchers and practitioners to talk about um, what's happening in that space. And so I put a link to the Communicating Science Seminar um, in the chat here. And I also wanna acknowledge my colleague, Alana Kimbrell, who is here um, with us in today's session and is actually the person who organizes the Communicating Science Seminar. So um, she has done so for a number of years and has done an excellent job of thinking about how do we bring together people who are um, researching best practices or promising practices in communication and engagement, as well as the um, practitioners who are doing this in the space. And then also bringing in other experts who are working in that area. So in some cases, it might be someone who's working in the evaluation field. It might be um, a community leader or someone from a community organization who is a part of a public engagement project <laughs> or uh, something else in that space. And we bring together people for short, uh, generally 60 to 90 minute conversations about what's happening in the space and give a chance for researchers and practitioners to share their views, to talk about how they've walk, worked with one another and to explore some of the spaces where maybe they haven't connected as well and to or, um, think about what some of the challenges are coming from a research perspective versus a practice perspective. Um, and having that space for conversation allows us to not only bring together a panel on a particular topic, whether that is how do you engage via social media, how do you build relationships with communities, how do you do inclusive engagement, but it also allows us to invite the uh, two, three, 400, 500 people in the room into that conversation. And so we allow plenty of space for not just the panel conversation, but for 
questions and discussion with the larger audience. And we curate that discussion um, via both social media input that people are providing as well as people in the room being able to come up, ask questions, be a part of the conversation. And then what we've introduced in the last few years is actually flipping from a, um, an all panel session to having the afternoon be an opportunity for um, more breakout and engagement in smaller, <laughs> in smaller groups where people are able to um, identify issues of research and practice that they would like to spend more time in conversation on um, with a small group. We have several of those breakout sessions each year now and those provide a space for even more conversation among people who are uh, both deeply immersed in research and practice in that particular area and for people who are just beginning um, to explore a particular area of public engagement. And so this allows us to not only cultivate conversations between experienced researchers and practitioners and provide space for people who are entering the field to have conversations and people who are in the field to sort of refine their, their research and practice, but also to provide a space for that um, conversation to flow back out into the community. And throughout the meeting then, people are able to continue those conversations at uh, more informal social networking sessions or at some of the more formal scientific sessions and bring those conversations back to their institutions when they leave the meeting. Yeah, we have a really amazing group of Sarah's in the room today. Did share one of the, the a challenge in the chat saying one of the more ch difficult aspects of being a boundary spinner is selling yourself to potential collaborators if you've moved on from being housed in a particular space. And the more boundaries you span, the more difficult it becomes. I'm really, you know, Sarah, would you unmute and share a little bit more about your experience? It's really, it sounds really, the, the spanning multiple boundaries, I definitely resonates with me, but please jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm somebody who has worked at universities and been in broader impacts work there, but I've worked at science museums. I have been a TV meteorologist communicating science. So I've been in these, a lot of these different arenas, worked directly with researchers while at the university, worked directly with practitioners in science museum settings. And so suddenly now I've got a, personally, I have a consulting practice and I'm trying to work across them, but I know a lot of people who maybe started off in research, then they moved into outreach and how do they still sell themselves to those former research partners that, yeah, no, I still, I can speak the language even though I've moved out of that space. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Is, and there's the question of like, how do you, especially in the research practice partnerships literature and, and experience of when you're, you're getting into a pretty small group is like, how do you find the right person? And we spend a lot of time in the, um, in the case task force talking about well, how, how do practitioners go about finding their researcher or how do those researchers go about finding their practitioners? And I think that's some of the idea behind the, the cohort um, idea that Sarah then shared of like, can we have some of this, this networking? Can we um, facilitate some of that networking so that people can find each other? You know, in, in my case, um, it was through yeah, it was through a conference, right? A co finding a conference where there were researchers and practitioners together. And um, and I definitely just did the, the, the walking. I was like, I knew I needed a researcher on my team. And I um, was did exactly what you're saying. Like walked up and said, I have this project. You should be on my team. <laughs> and it, But yeah, I think, and that's why, like, is that scalable? That's why I think that idea of, of trying to work at institutional levels might get us more traction in bridging these gaps because I just don't know that the small partnerships um are, you know it, it's probably an, an a, it's a um it's probably a an all approaches thing versus one or the other 
So I'm going to jump in here. And um, so I can't open it for whatever reason to not be view only. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm having a lot of technical issues today. But actually, I, I would actually like to hear um, more about this just so we can be a little bit more engaged in the session since we are recording it versus recording it on a mirror board that's eventually going to disappear. Nobody's going to see. Um, the idea was I get to put all these together later. But I do think it, it might be valuable to kind of listen and think about what are what are, how are some other ways that this challenge has manifested itself, right? What what um what should we be talking about? I suppose like one of the things we would like to get to are what are some ideas, right, that could solve this challenge. But I think the first thing is to identify an outline and and kind of think more about what the the challenge actually is. Um, so I would invite you to raise your hands, please come chat or put it in the chat. Um, thank you, Allison. Um, and so I'm just gonna read Allison's comment here. Allison mentions that it can be hard to get scientists comfortable integrating outside knowledge and expertise. Allison, I see that you have turned on your video. I don't need to read your words to everyone. Oh, you want, you want me to share. read your presentation? I just put in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I feel like this is probably good. I'm, I'm assuming that if people had their videos on, I would see a lot of heads nodding. Um, that process of getting um, getting our colleagues I, and as um, I was um, chatting with Emily or with Sarah Garlic, I, I work as a social scientist in a biophysical science space a lot of the time. So um, getting folks really comfortable with um, with true partnership with our non-academic experts and colleagues um, is a challenge. It's not part of the culture of science as it has sort of been taught so far, as we heard in our previous session to, this morning. Um, it's not part of the academic reward system to spend a lot of time working with folks sort of in an off-campus environment. Um, we're not training um, our young scientists to do this kind of work really well. So they're coming in not really knowing how to do partnership building and how to use social science or engaged methods. And um, we are still finding, you know, funders have not quite made the rhetoric match the amount of funding coming through grants so that we don't get travel money and money for the social science and money for, you know, just sitting and meeting with people and letting those relationships grow. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a long term process of um, partnership building, right? And one of the things we found in this cohort model that I tried is, is just that um, the out outputs are quite intangible in the short term, but may result in, in something more. Um, I see a hand up. Zaina, am I saying that right? I apologize if I'm not. It's pronounced Shauna. Shauna, I'm sorry. Um, Hi, I guess um, what I'm curious about is my interpretation of, of the goals of this session were about connecting research with like outreach practices and learning practices um, to the people that are doing it, which I think is different than just folks doing their science and then us trying to connect it to the community. So like for me, um, you know, I am working in uh, outreach role at a university. And as I'm mm, writing about my program, as I'm trying to get more people interested and working at a, a at an R1 institution, I want to be able to uh, access the research that supports the work that I'm doing. And I, <laughs> I studied marine science but I am a teacher, like I've been a teacher for 20 years. I don't know where to go to find the research that supports the work that I do. It's such a good point. And yes, we, we are thinking about connecting the science of the, the engagement um, to the practice. Um, and, and so one of the things we talked about in the, the paper that I was sharing, was the possibility so in you know in the cases that the projects we looked at those were well funded NSF projects that had teams of um, so, you know physical scientists social scientists and outreach engagement practitioners 
And they, and then through that work, we ended up getting to the stage of this thinking partnership where, where there was that, those connections that people could just call up their buddy who was a social scientist and say, do I have this right? How about this approach? Is there an evidence base for this? And so one of the things we talked about in our group was, could, could you, could you get to that thinking partner role in other methods. And one of the ideas, I don't work in a university, but in the university, within a university, could you try to cultivate those thinking partnerships across departments? Like in, if you have a department of science communication or a department of education, you know, trying to reach out to those to, and, and you can even share, I don't even know if this work, but share some of this literature and say, we're trying, we're trying to establish some, some, um, research practice partnerships or thinking partnership um, or boundary spanners across our, our um, different divisions within this R1. I don't know if that approach makes sense, but those are some of the ideas that we talked about in our group. I see some more ideas in the chat. And I think yeah. this is a little bit of the resource mapping that we were talking about, Sarah, and you know, that um, SciComm Bytes, Jacqueline is here. Uh, and so that's really helpful. Thank you for being here. We would love to hear from you. But SciComm Bytes, right, is one of those things that um, summarizes research. I don't, I don't want to say what it is when Jacqueline is here, when I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But I think um, there are other resources that do that. And so one of the things we would like to do is also a first outline the problem, which I think Shauna, you mentioned, right? It's it's finding the research on um, the the BI activities, the engagement activities, the communicating, um, but also are there resources that already exist for this, right? I think um, research practice partnerships and like a cohort model is not the only way that we can do this, and we probably need many ways of tackling this challenge. Um, so part of this is also, well, what are, what are some other things that we might do, right? Or what are some other models? There's um, what Psycom Bytes does, what uh, Alan All does, the link, I believe, is also trying to do. Thank you, Sarah. Yay, Quorum of Sarah's um, is also trying to do. And these are kind of put into bite-sized pieces, right? Uh, taking out all the technical jargon of the research and making it useful. Um, and then, you know, are there ways to also build partnerships or other models that might work? Um, I think another thing that's that's come up is, you know, our initial question of how this issue of research to practice resonates with people who are here right now. I think the issue is maybe it doesn't, or maybe it doesn't, it, or maybe it's not the top priority. Um, and I think that's something that is the challenge because if you're coming at this from sort of the researcher perspective, or if you've, you're someone who has a little bit more capacity to actually dig into the research and use that in your practice, you may be thinking of it more so than somebody who has, I know that a lot of people who are sort of their broader impacts person at their respective university, that's not the only hat you wear. And so you may not have the capacity to be thinking about research, you're just there to help facilitate those activities. Um, so I, I think that's a tension as well is, you know, is this just sort of an esoteric academic debate that we're having and it doesn't have that application to the real world um, versus, you know, something that I just need something to put out onto the table. I know it's a tension that exists, for example, at professional societies like where I've worked, where a lot of times the leadership is looking for something big and flashy and like, oh, we did this event. Does it follow the best practices in public engagement? Does it have an impact beyond the community of people who are already engaged? That I think that's not necessarily an incentive for leadership a lot of times. So I just want to sort of bring that up because it seems like that could be an issue as well. And I guess that spark some interest because we got a lot of hands raised now. Um, I guess uh, Sarah Quorum. I think one of the um, times when the people who are doing the broader impacts work most need the um, research is writing those grant proposals. That's when there's the expectation that you're supposed to actually have references in there. And so that's that's the most valuable time in the process. 
Jacqueline, go ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to try to verbalize something that isn't quite cohesive in, in my brain, but I, I find the benefit of there being more of this research practice divide more on the side of the research reflecting the practice more than the practice benefiting from the research. I mean, both are necessary, but where I see the gap more in that and you know, I've been really struggling with trying to find research that resonates with researchers who are, for the most part, going through these institutions, learning the science, learning the science communication, with whom this makes sense as a form of communication to represent the kind of emotionality, empathy, relationship building, relationship with community that really is underneath this um, research, you know, practice or public uh, engagement um, like process where it's not for the purpose of a project where it's not for the purpose of a science, but there is value in building community. And then from there comes the science as opposed to there's just meeting science that can be done until it's built, you know, community. And I don't mean to make it so, so binary, but, you know, the actual felt sense of what building community and relationships feels like just doesn't feel to me represented in the literature, even though there's amazing things in the literature and there's amazing things in practice that benefit both ways. And so that is something that I am really kind of chewing on and, and struggling with um, that seems to be a, a gap for me. And so that's why I think it, you know, it's not this esoteric practice, but I think you know, on the academic side, there's a lot that we need to catch up with um, on the, the practice side. And I, and I think about that as a researcher a lot, Jacqueline, I, I, I just, I wonder there, and we've talked about kind of the disconnect between what is academic currency and what is valuable to practice, right? And I think, um, at least in kind of the science communication research space, when I look around, I know informal science education is, is quite a little bit farther ahead than science communication, I think, on this. But when I think about science communication researchers, I think about how many researchers are in the spaces where practitioners live, right, and, and conversing and kind of thinking about what types of research projects. And I don't, I don't know that there are that many of us um, like, I think, I mean, this is a broader impact. So I look at this room, right? And I wonder how many are social science researchers, you know, that who do the 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 work that serves practice. And I, I don't know. And so one of my things I, I think about also kind of a half formed thought um, is how, how to encourage researchers to engage in these spaces more and what's, you know, what needs to change um, for that to happen. And, it's it's quite an intractable um, so far that I've come across. I have I haven't had any good ideas is what I'm trying to say, right? Um, but I I see Jocelyn has made a comment in the chat, and I want to um, and and Stephanie as well. So we want to try to get to those. Um, so Stephanie's comment is about uh, research in engaging marginalized communities. And, and yeah, that's, you know, we don't have a lot of that. I think that's a space that we certainly need to fill. But I think this gets to Jacqueline's comment of how the research doesn't reflect what is important in practice, right? What is prioritized in practice. Um, and that's, that's a challenge that you know, and I think this is why we wanted to have the session is sort of opening it up to are there ideas are there what can we do stephanie i see your hands raised yes sorry um <laughs> i was typing when you said my name but um this is something that i i think a lot of, about because um now that i am you know scientist who still does some psychom but who's a di practitioner um with a social justice orientation and bend 
Um, it's the realization of just how compartmentalized these spaces are to your point and to Jacqueline's point. And what I found is that, you know, a lot of the research exists, it's just not in the specific context. So when we're, you know, it, it's going to be difficult to look at a more connected research base, I think, because it's really not supported and resourced to do, like even just connecting, researching the practice of SciComm, right? Um, I just, I think it's really under-resourced. And then, you know, one thing that I felt was really disjointed and, and kind of clamoring was of course, um, well, I'm saying of course, as if everyone felt the same way, um, there was just an undeniable gap in terms of the engagement and the relationship between marginalized communities that was revealed around COVID and, and vaccinations and, and, you know, the transfer of information, not just as, you know, this is, these are the facts, this is the data, but a, a bi-directional, right, essentially being deeply engaged and having an understanding of knowledge of, of the relationship between science, science communication, and marginalized communities. And so it's, it was something for me where the, I'm sure over the years, over the coming years, there's going to be more um, investment in some resource, but even then I doubt it's going to be enough. But, um, you know, the, these questions of how do we connect the research and the practice, it, um, I think it, it is a lot, there's a lot about it that is actually like going in and adapting other research that's there and developing models around that. And then looking at the practice that is, is heavily understudied and then saying, you know, where do the resources need to be? Who has the capacity to uh, commit resources and how do we <laughs> get them to actually commit those resources? Thank you for that, Stephanie. I, I agree. And I think the, um, oh, there's so many threads there that are important. I think one that in the, in the, I remember, I don't know, the first year of the pandemic talking with some science communication researchers who were just like, okay, the, I'm seeing this play out how hard practice is, right? Like in this just really for the first time, recognizing the challenge that those of us that are in the practitioner world face play out on this like global scale. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And the other, and then the other piece about different strands of research and then, and, and then like I have found, um, so I, I, I don't know, like I'm sort of following someone else like the, I'm gonna be a little messy in my thinking here, but often researchers I've worked with have like a particular um, framework, right? Or, or thread that they sort of follow on their intellectual path as a, as a scholar. And as a practitioner, I'm often like reading all kinds of literatures, you know, I'm over in informal science learning, I'm over in SciComm, I'm over in sustainability science and policy and trying to find, okay, what are the nuggets of insight that are gonna make my work better? And um, I, that can be a challenge <laughs> because um, not that, because you can't find one person who can like speak to you about all those things. and. Um, I don't know if maybe that's a, the wrong approach. Maybe I shouldn't do that, but I'm always, the, the pitch I've tried to make is that I, I think practitioners might be in the position to make um, more advancements because we're not as limited by like a certain type of, of a genre, right? Or framework, like we can make connections that um, some scholars are not really empowered to do, but that's maybe, a, I don't know, wishful thinking. <laughs> Other thoughts? I think we're gonna turn it over to Reese for the wrap up and next steps. Oh, she's having coughing issues. <laughs> we, we so quickly run out of time, I think in these sessions and we kind of like an hour is kind of just enough to get started, right? We've just kind of started um, scratching the surface here. But Jeff, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. So I, I think 
you know, this is like Sarah said, we could talk about this for hours. Um, we're sort of curious, sort of as a group, is there, are there next steps that can be taken? I mean, obviously it's good to get all these ideas out there. And as we've said, we've, we've talked about them a lot. So do people have ideas or an interest even in sort of continuing this line of discussion to see if there's something either that each of us can do individually or as a collective? Um, if so, I'm just gonna, I just created a real quick Google form um, if people are interested and I'll share a link for that um, in the chat. But if, if people have ideas about what they wanna discuss next, um, this is the time. If not, we can um, see if anybody wants to connect. Um, this is something that the four of us sort of reconnected on a couple months ago and just started talking about. So that's to say we have not, we're not like at this far away place and asking people to come along. Like we are all in the same place of discussing this. And so we'd love to have other, other perspectives involved in that. And I will add, thank you for covering for me while I was coughing there, Jeff. Um, we also, you don't have to have big grand ideas at this point. Um, having, you know, thinking about what you can do in your own work is great. Thinking about what you can do in the short term, even just during Eris, like, you know, find a buddy from that other side, whether it's a researcher or a practitioner, and talk about the sessions that you're going to and have those conversations. And that's a really good place to start. And I think I would also like to hear kind of from what, like what Sarah said, right? She shared how she kind of tries to bridge the research practice given the resources that you have currently, right? And I'm, I'm curious as to how others have done this because from the researcher perspective, I, I um, try, I guess, from to make connections with practitioners, but there is kind of, I, I am, well, A, I'm, I'm one researcher. There's a lot of practitioners, right? I try to um, kind of do the research that hopefully helps, but I, you know, I wonder how to get others into this, right? What, what are the things that need to happen? Is it just that we need to have more conversation? Is it that we need to have more networking? Is it that we need these fears to overlap a little more? I, um, agree with Jacqueline that it would be very useful to discuss the challenges that are right systemic uh, and personal. There's, I mean, personal, I'll be honest, I just don't have that much bandwidth, really. Um, but there are, I think, systemic challenges that um, prevent us, or that at least are some barriers to having these conversations. Um, but, you know, we are still kind of in the beginning beginning stages, mostly because we were derailed by COVID, like most people were, right, of having these conversations. But I think it's an important space to, and, and important conversations to have to find the connection points between research and public engagement and broader impacts, right, um, and the practice of it. Because as a researcher, I kind of don't I personally don't see the point of my research unless it helps practice. I know there are other perspectives on this and they're all valid, but that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from, right? Um, Sarah just put, sorry, I'm trying to read the chat in addition to talk. Oh, I was just adding another, I mean, just, I, I feel like our chat is actually a pretty nice record of some ideas and resources. Um, and so I was trying to add just an, just a, um, a follow-up from Shana's question of, of like finding examples of, of where um, these challenges are solved. I feel like, the, and especially in the research practice partnerships literature, there's just a ton of case studies. They're just individual examples. And it's kind of fun to read those because um, you're like, oh, well, that's how that group of, of people navigated that boundary. And that's how they dealt with that issue of not having resources or, oh, I didn't think about um, how we're communicating about our results and, and are, is just the researcher getting the credit or are the practitioners getting the credit too? I mean, all of these things that um, Jeff had this great saying, like reinventing the flat tire. Like we, there's all of these research, these groups have been, um, I'm always trying to learn from others, right? And I just feel like these, there's a lot of projects who've been navigating this space and as much as we can 
learn from them and not have to reinvent the flat tires that's that's helpful um so anyway this is all to say i'm 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 saving the chat i hope folks other folks are um and and i think more um opportunities for building those connections are are just on everyone's mind And as Jeff mentioned, he's dropped a Google Forms link. I'm really sorry about all my tech issues. I'm usually not this challenged when it comes to technology, but today is, is kind of one of those days, I guess. Um, everybody has one, I suppose. But if you're interested in following up, please uh, let us know. He's dropped a link in the chat um, and we can do that again in case it's kind of scrolled up. Um, and we would love to hear from you and, you know, in the, remaining couple of minutes we would love any closing thoughts that you might have i have one not, thought yeah you know, just coming through my head in our conversations is just keeping in mind the the importance of um, power imbalance that can often happen when you have that combination of somebody who is coming in with the NSF grant or whatever sort of thing, and then you have the nonprofit or the after school program or whatever that or other might be, but just really keeping in mind the power imbalances that are inherent oftentimes in these kinds of relationships. I really, really like that. Thank you for mentioning that. And I think um, one thing I, I've tried to do at least is, is kind of build proposals with a practice partner in mind um, and, and building it collaboratively because there's, you know, I think, and maybe this is the nature of the proposals I build as well is that they tend to have a practice component in it and the research serves the practice. And so I don't know, anything about the practice, right? I'm a communication professor, but I know nothing about making videos and science videos, right? So I can't do that part and I have zero expertise in that part. And so we're very equal in that sense, which I think is maybe a little bit naive because there is some like, some power dynamic, right? When it comes to research and practice, but I um, hopefully try to encourage my, that my, I, I, I'm just very happy to say I don't know how to do these things. And so that's not, you know, I'm gonna take it from you to help me with that. And I can do this part, that's my expertise, but you know. Um, and yeah, how, how do we build those, right? So that's kind of a big part of the conversation. How do we just make those connections and have those relationships to write those proposals perhaps? Um, and, you know, I don't think it's all that. Maybe we just, we need more people to work with Jacqueline on Psycom Bytes. Um, but thank you all so much. And thank you for sticking with us to the end in this sort of thought process and, and learning community that we're hoping to get together, I suppose. Yeah, I, I don't know if people were expecting sort of answers and solutions from us, um, but hopefully you're, enjoying sort of the discussion and the messiness of of this discussion and like sarah and sarah said we hope that you're interested in in joining this discussion to see if there's something that can be done long term but as reese mentioned there are also sort of short-term steps that hopefully folks can think about throughout the rest of this conference um, so i think we can wrap up with that so thanks everybody for coming